when you think of music in Jane Austen, something more classical probably comes to mind. Something like this. You could just feel Mr. Darcy or Mr. Knightley or any of the other dashing Austen heroes dancing the night away with you. But sometimes more modern music is used in adaptations, and that's what I want to talk about today. I tend to be a very visual person, so when a song is used in a movie or TV show, especially one that I tend to rewatch a lot, it can easily become a favorite of mine. It's probably one of the reasons I love listening to movies, scores, and soundtracks so much, and I do tend to rewatch awesome adaptations a bit. A bit? I don't need snide comments. Okay, more than a bit. Please. Fine, I watch them a lot. And since I watch them so much, I tend to like the songs featured in them a lot. Uh, before we get on with things, let's settle on the definition of pop music for our purposes. We are talking about pop music as a music that is popular, but might not strictly fall under the stricter genre of pop music. I just don't really feel like leaving a song out because it falls more on the rock or indie side. Also, as much as I would love to sit here and play all of these songs for you, I don't think YouTube would like that very much. And I'll be honest, I don't know how to do that without getting this video a copyright strike right away. So instead, I will be providing a Spotify code for all the songs I can, which is unfortunately not all of them. I will also be making a YouTube playlist of the songs I talk about in this video. Okay, let's talk about some music already. Okay, first off is Clueless. Clueless is kind of the perfect movie to start with for this video. As I'm sure most people who have managed to find their way to this video are aware, Clueless is a modern adaptation of Emma, and its soundtrack is honestly iconic. I genuinely listen to it all the time and even have it on vinyl. Another reason it's kind of a perfect start is that I want to share any interesting information I can find about these songs, and I also just happen to have the perfect book for this. The book, as if the oral history of Clueless, has a whole section about the soundtrack. So when I call the Clueless soundtrack iconic, it's not just because I happen to really like it. The Clueless soundtrack actually did really well. It was certified platinum, which means it sold at least 1 million copies. You had to Google that, didn't you? Wouldn't you have to Google that too? You were just being all judgy. Whatever. Anyways, if you actually listen to the official Clueless soundtrack, you'll find a lot of the music from the film, but not all of it. That's not super uncommon in movie soundtracks, so we'll probably see that again in this video. There are many reasons for this. For instance, back in the day, there was a limit for how many songs could be on a CD. And the Clueless soundtrack was produced by Capitol Records, who understandably wanted their artist on the album. According to co-producer Adam Schroer, that's the reason Just a Girl by No Doubt is not on the soundtrack. Even though music supervisor Karen Rackman wanted it to be the lead single. She said it should have been on that record, it would have made that record even better. After all that, I find it kind of funny that all the young dudes by World Party did manage to get on the record. Since according to Colin Wellner from the band, only about 9 seconds of it are in the movie. I feel like that scene is longer than 9 seconds. Yeah, me too, but I'm quoting him here. A lot of the songs featured on the soundtrack are still making money for their artists. Josh Caterer from The Smoking Pipes, whose song Need You Around plays over the credits, said, The Clueless soundtrack is the thing that has survived that era of our career and continues to generate more publishing income than anything else we ever did. I know I, for one, cannot help but dance around to the music from this film. Every time I hear Kids in America or Rolling With My Homies or Supermodel, I get a smile on my face and my voice sounds just a bit more Valley Girl. Okay, from high school in California in the 90s to 30-somethings in London in the 2000s, let's talk about Bridget Jones Diaries. I love these movies. In fact, I'm pretty sure the first one is the first rated R movie my mom ever let me watch. Did she realize it was rated R when she put it on? Unclear. We're actually going to talk about the soundtracks of all three films in this franchise since all of them did pretty well. I mean, the first one's based off Pride and Prejudice, but what about the other two? Oh, Bridget Jones The Edge of Reason is actually loosely based on Persuasion. And what about Bridget Jones Baby? Well, it's my video, and I do what I want. All three of the soundtracks for the Bridget Jones movies have done pretty well in England. And fun fact, the score for the first one was actually done by Patrick Doyle, who was nominated for an Oscar for the score of the 1995 Sense of Sensibility. 
Bridget Jones is another movie where there are songs that when I hear it, I can just picture the scene in the movie. One of those is All By Myself, and honestly, I think we all feel very seen by watching Bridget drunkenly lip sync to it. Isn't that song also in Clueless? Yes, but another one of those songs that is in the movie and not on the official soundtrack. The other two movies also have iconic record drops. Who can forget Bridget running around Mark Darcy's office while Crazy in Love plays in The Edge of Reason? Or the beautiful wedding in Bridget Jones' Baby was still falling for you playing, which Ellie Goulding actually recorded for the soundtrack. The singer Jamila also recorded a cover of Stop for Edge of Reason because she was such a big fan of the first movie. The first two movies also feature iconic fight scenes between Mark Darcy and Daniel Cleaver, which feature great songs. The first one has a cover of It's Raining Men from Jerry Hallowell, and the second one has I Believe in a Thing Called Love. Hallowell's cover of It's Raining Men was actually the number one song in the UK for two weeks. All three of the soundtracks for the Bridget Jones movies complement them really well. A review of the soundtrack from The Edge of Reason said, It is a generally enjoyable, if slick, musical counterpart to the film's frothy, romantic shenanigans. And I agree, the songs in these movies might be a bit obvious at some points, but you know what? Sometimes that's what works. We've been talking a lot about Western songs so far, but that is not all of what Jane Austen adaptations have for us. Bride and Prejudice and Aisha are both Bollywood versions of Jane Austen novels and have great soundtracks. The songs in Bride and Prejudice are just so fun and I would listen to them every day, but to my eternal dismay, the soundtrack is not on Spotify. <laughs> the songs are classic to many Austen fans. Who can forget No Life Without Wife? or the Falling in Love montage set to Take Me to Love. Aisha also has some really fun songs. In a lot of ways, Aisha reminds me of Clueless, especially with how music is used, especially things for like shopping montages and like makeover montages. And the Aisha soundtrack is on Spotify, so I get to listen to it while I'm driving around, and I love that. Okay, let's move on to a favorite of mine. <clears throat> what? Excuse me. What? Well, if you're gonna talk about pop songs used in Jane Austen things, I don't wanna, but it totally fits. Fine, let's talk about Lost in Austen. Here's the thing, I don't like Lost in Austen. My biggest problem with it is how it handles the Wickham and Lydia stuff, which funny enough, I go into in my video from last year's Virtual Gen Con. So go check that out. But yes, it does have a moment with pop music. There's a scene where the main character, Amanda, who is a modern woman who has switched places with Elizabeth Bennet, is asked to sing something and she sings the song Downtown, which confuses all the Pride and Prejudice characters and ended up confusing me a lot. So maybe this scene works if you get to actually watch it in context while you're watching the miniseries. But I did not get to do that. For what I assume are copyright reasons, this scene was cut from the American DVD of Lost in Austin, but they literally just cut the part where she sings, but kept all the characters talking about it afterwards. It was really badly done and just confused me when I was watching it. So I guess a warning is that if you are wanting to use a song in a movie or TV show, make sure you can use it in other places or at least have a plan if you can't. For instance, TV shows like Dairy Girls have had to switch the songs when they are coming to America, but they don't just like cut the scene. But just don't do whatever it is that Lost in Austin decided to do. Okay, let's go back to something I actually want to talk about and let's get into the soundtrack of Austin Land. I legitimately listen to this soundtrack all the time. I love it so much. A lot of the songs on the soundtrack were recorded by the English singer-songwriter Emmy the Great. Some of my personal favorites are the song Love, Darcy, and Comic Books, and her cover of the song Only You. There is also an amazing scene featuring Nellie's hot in here. The main character, Jane, is a woman who has paid to go to Austin Land, which is an immersive Jane Austen-themed resort. And when she is asked to sing and play piano, that is the only song she knows, and it is fantastic. And unlike the scene in Lost in Austin, it is not randomly cut out of my copy of the DVD. Oh, come on, that's a low blow. You're not even talking about Lost in Austin anymore. I will take any shot at Lost in Austin I can get. 
Anyways, sticking around for the end credits of Austinland is totally worth it for another song by Emmy the Great, aptly named Austinland, and for a delightful scene of the cast dancing in period costume too hot in here. And now let's talk about the newest movie on our list, Emma 2020. Unlike most of the other things we've talked about in this video so far, Emma is not really a modern adaptation at all. But it's Mr. Knightley, Johnny Flynn, wrote and performed the song Queen Bee for the credits. And then you became obsessed with it. I mean, I wouldn't say obsessed. Oh, really? No. Uh, fine. Maybe a little obsessed. The song was actually my top played Spotify song in 2020. And 2021. I guess check back in December to see if that streak kept going. So there's no denying that I love this song. And it made me listen to a lot of Johnny Flynn's other work. And guys, he's just really talented. He also does his own singing and violin playing in a scene in the movie. One thing I think he did exceptionally well with Queen Bee is that since it kind of has a folksy feel to it, it really vibes well with the rest of the movie. I've often found that credit songs in movies can be quite jarring sometimes, especially if like the rest of the movie soundtrack isn't tons of like pop music. But this one flows so well with the rest of the movie set in the past, despite being a modern song. According to Johnny Flynn, the song is supposed to flip things up a bit to be in Mr. Knightley's perspective about his love for Emma, while the rest of the movie is, of course, from her point of view. And I'm not the only one who loved the song. David Elric of IndieWire called the song one of the best movie songs in recent memory, as well as a spectacular testament to Flynn's talents. And obviously, I'm in agreement. Song is so often such a big part of movies and TV, and often it can make or break a scene. But now I'm curious, what are your favorite pop music moments in Jane Austen adaptations, or are there any that I missed? Let me know. Well, thank you for watching this video and all of the others that are part of Virtual Jane Con. And I especially want to thank Bianca Hernandez Knight and all of the other volunteers for putting this on every year. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone around virtually, so if you see Drama Dork 884, that is me, basically everywhere, so come by and say hi and enjoy the con! Hi Arnold, are you annoyed that I'm recording a video and not in bed? Snuggling with you yet? I think the answer is yes. I do believe so.